And tonight we're going to be deviating a little bit from our doctrine series. And I had something else prepared to teach here tonight. And God said, no, you're heading in this direction. So I'm going to obey the Holy Ghost here tonight. And I want God to speak to us. And if this only helps one person in this room, and I pray it helps everybody. But if this only helps one person in this room, then, then we've obeyed the Holy Ghost. But I want it to help each and every one of us. I pray that God helps and ministers to every single one of us here tonight. And uh, I know it's Wednesday night. It's Bible study night. Uh, but I feel to preach, teach, preach here tonight. And I pray that God ministers in the midst of his people. Luke chapter 22, verse number 31. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, when you turn and walk in a different direction, when there's a change or a transformation in you, I want you to strengthen thy brethren. Strengthen thy brethren. For the next little bit, with the help of the Lord, I want to preach, teach. I don't know how far we'll go, and I don't know where we're going to land here tonight, but I want to obey the Holy Ghost. I want God to speak amongst his people. I'm going to preach on sifting and strengthening. Sifting and strengthening. I wonder if we, before we're seated, could just lay our Bibles down and lift our hands and lift our voices here in this house. Hallelujah. How many want God to speak to you tonight? Hallelujah. I wonder if we could lift our voices and magnify the name of Jesus. If we could petition heaven right now, God, we want you to speak to our hearts. God, we're desirous of you. We're hungry for you tonight. We're hungry for your spirit, God. We want your word to go forth. Let it be like a hammer. I pray that you would break the rock into pieces tonight, God. Let it be like a hammer. Let it get to the very center of who we are, God. Let it get to the core of who I am. I pray that you would touch us, that you would strengthen us by your word and strengthen us by your spirit and your grace here tonight, God. We're hungry for you. We're thirsting for you tonight. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you for standing. You may be seated. We look at this scripture here and we realize that there was a lot that Simon Peter went through from the moment that God called him. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, walks up and says, I want you to follow me and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Little did they know that when they laid down their earthly desires and they laid down their earthly uh, vocation at that point, all that was going to entail in the three, three and a half years or so that they were going to spend following Jesus. And oh, the sights that they would behold and witness as Jesus would heal, as Jesus would restore, as Jesus would speak the word as Jesus would forgive sins, as Jesus would even do things on the Sabbath day uh, in controversy to what the Pharisees were saying, defying what they were saying and saying, hey, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. Jesus reading the prophecies of Isaiah in the house of God and saying, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I don't know that they fully understood at that point what they were going to have to encounter. But I believe that each and every one of us, that God has come to us and said, follow me. I want to make you a fisher of men. But thank God at the moment he asked us to follow him, that he didn't show us everything that we were going to have to go through in our walk with him. Thank God he didn't show us everything that we'd have to face in following him and him making us a fisher of men. And so they took it day by day and they took it uh, mile by mile as they understood and started to see the, the kingdom of heaven described in the words of Jesus fulfilled before their very eyes. And yet we see right before the crucifixion that the Lord looks at Simon Peter and says, Satan hath desired you to sift you as wheat. This is the man that he looked at and said, hey, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you're going to bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you're going to loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'll take a side path here today as there needs to be some binding and loosing in our prayer. I pray, God, that you take our prayer from where it is to the next level. 
I pray that you take us from where we are in the spirit. Church, it's not time to just sit back on our hands and say, okay, God, we're just going to enjoy this new place and this new space. No, if we've ever prayed and needed to pray, it's right now. We need to seek after God. We need to seek after the Holy Ghost. There needs to be some binding in the spirit, and there needs to be some loosing in the spirit. And AC, it's going to happen as a result of prayers that you're praying that God would break the yoke, that God would lift the heavy burden, that God would, would cause some people chains to fall off in the spirit. Some things are depending on you in the spirit for you to start praying those types of prayers. Hallelujah. And so he looked at him and said, Satan hath desired you to sift you as wheat. If we look at wheat in scripture, we see the fruitfulness of wheat, but we also understand that on the outside of wheat exists something called chaff. And also growing right next to wheat is something called tares. And I'm not going to go through all of the details here for the sake of time. But we have to understand that in order for wheat to be useful, in order for wheat to be used as its intended purpose, there has to be a sifting process that happens. In order for wheat to become the flower that it was intended to become, there has got to be a sifting process where you say, well, the Lord told him that Satan desired him to sift him as wheat. I'm here to declare that God knows how to use things that others do to us and even things that the enemy does to us to cause a sifting and a fruitfulness to happen in our lives. God doesn't want you to succumb to the sifting because he says, I pray for you that your faith fail you not. And so God does not want your faith to fail in the midst of the sifting process. But I'll tell you, nothing happens in our lives. I want you to pay close attention here that God does not allow in our lives. There is nothing happening in our lives, in our churches, in our families that's taking God by surprise. But there is sometimes a sifting process that has to happen, uh, number one, in order to get our attention, uh, and two, to understand and to uphold the strength of our faith in the midst of it all. Right. We see this wind that drives away the chaff in our lives. There first has to be a crushing process as the chaff is broken uh, and as the chaff is separated from the wheat. Uh, but it's got not enough just for the chaff and the wheat to sit together. Uh, there's something called a fan, a winnowing fan, which blows away the chaff. It blows away the idolatry, the carnality. Uh, it blows away the things in our life that are not supposed to be there. Uh, and child of God, if you're in the middle of a sifting process, uh, that might be God allowing some things in your life. Uh, and I want to encourage you, don't let your faith fail uh, in the midst of those things. Uh, don't let your faith Faith fail in the midst of the sifting process. Understand that God wants you to hold fast to your faith in the midst of the things that he's trying to strip away and that he's trying to blow away. The Bible says he's got a fan in his hand. There is a wind that's going to blow, but sometimes God has to allow those things to happen in our lives in order for the chaff of our lives to be removed. Ungodliness, the things of this world, even sometimes complacency and apathy has to be stripped away so that we can understand, God, I want to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. If ever we've struggled with, I know this is a big word, but decadence in our society, it's right now. If ever as the church and as a nation we've struggled with it, and I realize the economy isn't what it used to be, but we still are a very blessed people. And if we're not careful, we can allow the decadence of the world to make its way into the church to where we become rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. I pray that God helps us in everything that we do and everything that we face. And when we pray and say, God, if there's anything in my life that needs to be stripped away, if there's any chaff in my life that you need to take away, if there's anything, God, I need to deal with in my life, then God, right here, April 10th, 2024, 
I want you to do it before I walk out this, this building, uh, before I walk out those doors to my car, God. Uh, I want there to be a stripping away uh, of ungodliness. I want there to be a stripping away uh, of the weights. Uh, I want there to be a stripping away of the sins. Uh, I'm telling you here tonight, if you're facing something uh, that you're having a hard time overcoming, uh, God can deliver you before this service is over. Uh, I'm here to declare tonight, if you're struggling with addictions, uh, God is able to make the way uh, and to those have those things taken away uh, from you. If you're struggling with offense uh, or bitterness tonight, I'm telling you, you don't have to leave here uh, with those things in your life. Uh, if you're struggling with hurt, uh, God's able to pour in some oil uh, and pour in some wine to those hurts tonight. Uh, and you can walk out of here a new creature uh, in Christ. Uh, you can say, God, old things are passed away uh, and all things are become new. Uh, if you're struggling with ungodliness, uh, then God can strip away the ungodliness tonight, uh, and you can walk out of here uh, victorious and uh, an overcomer. Uh, I'm here to declare, uh, if you are struggling with music, uh, if you're struggling with pornography, uh, if you're struggling with the things of this world, uh, you are not alone in your struggle, uh, but God is able to do a work uh, that only He is able to do. Uh, he doesn't want you to stay surrounded by that chaff. Uh, let God remove the chaff from your life. Let God strip away the chaff from your life so that you can be fruitful and useful in the kingdom of God. Too many times we find ourselves living within the comfort of the chaff. We find ourselves surrounded and cocooned by the chaff. And we become comfortable in the chaff. I'm going to say that again. We become comfortable in the chat. I know what I'm dealing with. I know what God's spoken to me here. I know what some of you are dealing with because God showed me what you're dealing with. And I'm telling you here tonight, there is grace and there is mercy. There is enough blood that's flowing in this house for God to strip away the chaff of your life and for you to get to a place of victory, for you to get to a place of overcoming, for you to get to a place of fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. Why don't we pray right now? Why don't we lift our hands? I pray that God, that you, whatever you got to do in this service, whatever you got to do to take me from where I am to where you want me to be, I pray that you would take me there, God. There is hope and there is blessing. There is strength and there is promise in the house of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For wheat, during the harvesting process, there is a crushing, a trampling, a beating process that happens in order to separate that wheat from the chaff. Sometimes you may feel like you're being crushed, like you're being trampled, like you're being beat. But again, as I mentioned, nothing that happens in our lives takes God by surprise. And nothing in our lives happens by mistake. I choose who I am on the other end of that, by the grace of God, of course. But ultimately, we've heard Brother Hopkins so beautifully preach this. Do you smell like the smoke when you emerge from the flames? Something that the Bible points out about the three Hebrew children that were thrown into the fiery furnace is the Bible says they didn't even smell like what they went through when they came out of it. I'm asking tonight, do you smell like the smoke of the trial that you're going through up? Or are you saying, God, I'm choosing to let you blow the chaff away uh, in my life. I'm choosing to let you uh, make me a new creature. Uh, I'm choosing to let old things uh, become old things. Uh, and I'm choosing, God, to step into victory, uh, to step into fruitfulness, uh, to step into calling, uh, to step into anointing. Uh, I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. Uh, it's time for us as a church uh, to step forward in Jesus' name uh, and to say, God, whatever you've got to strip away, uh, do it in Jesus' name. Name. Even if it takes a trampling, a beating, a process that separates. I'm not going to talk about the tares here. Maybe we'll leave that for another service. But sometimes the tares have to be allowed to grow next to the wheat, lest we pluck up the wheat by trying to pluck up a tear. But I believe that there is a sifting process that's going on in the spirit. You say, well, why would God use those things to sift things out of my life? 
I want to introduce you to a man named Job. And everything that happened in Job's life happened as a result of the permission from God. The Lord looked at Satan and said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And yet we understand that Job, in the midst of all that he went through, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 23 and 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. There is a process that we go through in order to let what's in us to shine forth as gold. The beauty is there, but sometimes God has to strip away the things that should not be there in order to reveal what is already there. When Michelangelo carved the statue of David, he started with a flawed piece of marble. It had been said that all the other good pieces had already been taken away. And so he looked at this flawed piece of marble. He studied it. And then he formed it. And someone asked him, they said, how did you carve such a beautiful sculpture from something that was flawed? He said, the beauty was already there. I just had to remove what wasn't supposed to be there to review what was to, to, to reveal what was already there. I'm telling you, you may feel like a flawed piece of marble in working in the kingdom of God. You may say, God, all the other pieces have been taken, they're being used. But I'm telling you, there's a maker that's looking at you. There's a maker that's studying you. There's a maker that's going to form you. But in order to form you and to reveal the beauty of what's there, there has to be a stripping away of what's not supposed to be there. And I believe I'm in a room full of people here tonight that you're going to pray with me and say, God, remove what's not supposed to be there. Remove the anger. Remove the bitterness. Remove the offense. Remove ungodliness. Remove the hurt. Remove the shame. I pray, God, that you give the church a revival over shame. The enemy wants to use shame to keep you into a place of paralysis. The enemy wants to use shame to keep you, keep you in a place that says, I can never be used by God anymore. I'm here to defy shame and say that is not the will of God for you to live in shame. Let the artist take away what's not supposed to be there. Let the artist strip away the shame that's not supposed to be there. Don't let shame keep you back from the beauty of what God's calling you and anointing you to do in the kingdom of God. Don't let shame keep you back and say, you know what? I'll never be good enough. I'll never be high enough. I'll never go far enough. No, I'm here to declare, don't let shame keep you back from becoming what the artist has already purposed for you to become. This is, I don't want to get myself in trouble here and cross theological swords. Where he says, and you hath he predestined. Predestination is not you just being predestined to become a certain thing. But I'm telling you, there is a pattern that God has for each and every one of our lives. But our inability to get there is not God's fault. Me not getting to the pattern of what God's created for my life is not his fault. It's my fault. I will never become what God created for me to do until I allow him to take away what's not supposed to be there. But oftentimes we resist the hammer and the chisel of the artist because we don't like the beating and we don't like the crushing and we don't like the removal and we don't like it. But I'm telling you, every single piece of stone that flecks away from that is creating and revealing what's already there, what God wants to make as part of who you are. And I'll tell you here today, we cannot do what we do without the Holy Ghost. We cannot do what we do without the Spirit of God. And so if you need a renewing in the Holy Ghost tonight before you leave this house, God can refill you with the Holy Ghost. You can speak in tongues all over again. You can be renewed in your spirit, in your heart, and in your mind. But we got to let God take away those things so that he can fill them with his spirit. He removes what's not useful and not profitable and not fruitful in order to turn what's there into something fruitful, profitable, and useful. 
Malachi 3 and 3 says, He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Church, God's calling us to greater things. God's calling us to higher things. God's calling us to bigger things. I don't want anything that's useless or unnecessary to hold me back from where he wants us to go. God's got a plan for your life. God's got a purpose and a calling for your life. But I'm telling you, sometimes what keeps us back from the purpose, the calling, uh, and yea, I say, uh, any ministry that God's called us to uh, is our own inhibitions. Keeping stuff in my life that should not be there. And not dealing with stuff in my life that needs to be dealt with. I want to challenge us as a church. If there's something we need to deal with, we got to deal with it. If there's spirits that are being entertained that you got to deal with, you need to deal with it. You need to get it out of your home. You need to get it out of your car. You need to get it out of your ears. Get it out of your mind. Get it away from your eyes. If there's something that you got to deal with, I'm telling you right now, under the unction of the Holy Ghost, you got to deal with it. You got to get rid of it. You got to push it out so that God can let the beauty of the church, the beauty of the Spirit, get the flies out of the apothecary. Get the flies out of the what makes the ointment stink. Because it's just a little bit that can taint an entire thing that's beautiful. Just a minuscule. Well, it's just a little bit of disobedience. It's just a, a little bit of rebellion. It's just, I, I'm doing everything except. I'm doing all that God's word has asked me to do except. But I'm telling you, the except is what's tainting the entire apothecary. The little bit that I'm holding on to that's not useful is tainting what God wants to reveal in terms of the beauty. I believe I'm in a room full of people. God wants to anoint you, to use you like he's never used you before. To where you open your mouth and I'm telling you the gift of prophecy comes out. Uh, the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Uh, but I'm telling you what holds us back uh, is holding on to yesterday. Uh, and holding on to the unuseful things in our lives. Uh, and holding on to what should uh, not be there. Uh, NAC, uh, God is calling us to bigger things and higher things uh, and deeper things. Uh, don't hold on to something uh, that's going to keep you from launching out uh, into the deep. Uh, I know the deep sometimes can be a scary place. Uh, and the deep sometimes can be a place uh, where it's unknown. Uh, but don't hold on to the side of the boat uh, and risk missing out uh, on what God has for you. Uh, I believe that God is going to use people uh, even in the store, uh, in the realm of healing. Uh, to where you walk up to someone and say, hey, uh, I don't know what you're going through. Uh, I don't know what you're facing right now. But but God told me to come pray with you. God told me to come talk to you. Church, this needs to be a church that is both a church of the word and a church of the spirit. Where we are spirit led. Where we walk in the spirit. We walk in the spirit. He says when you walk in the spirit, you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans 8 and 18, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Sometimes in order to get to glory revealed, we've got to go through present sufferings. We want the glory. We want the anointing. We want the power of God. I know what I'm preaching right now. But sometimes the suffering and sometimes the, the chaff being removed and sometimes the sifting. We tap out in the midst of the sifting. We say, God, I wasn't made for this. God, I, I can't deal with this. But I'm telling you, he says the glory that's going to be revealed, it's going to come after the sifting process. The glory and the anointing and the things that are richer in your life are going to come after the sifting process. But you've got to let him put you on that potter's wheel. you got to let him put the pressure. you got to let him take out the impurities. you got to let him form you into what he's called you to be. 
I'm going to say it this way, that you will never be more alone than when you're alone with God. And you'll never be more not alone than when you're alone with God. You might feel throughout the week, God, why do I feel this heaviness? Why do I feel like there's just a weight right here? Maybe God's calling you to pray. Maybe God's calling you to intercession. Maybe God's calling you to pray prayers you've never prayed before. Make commitments like you've never made before. To go places you've never gone before in prayer and fasting and devotion. Maybe there's a weight that's sitting on your heart that says, God's calling you to more. God's calling you to higher. Maybe there is a stripping away of the wheat or the chaff from the wheat in your life. I know I've hit this here a few times, but I pray that God takes us there. And I'm going to ask a young person, Ignite, empowered, middle-aged elders, when's the last time God used you in the realm of the gift of, of, of intercession? When's the last time God used you in the realm of intercession? Where you weren't waiting for somebody else to intercede, but you were interceding. Where you allowed the Holy Ghost to pray through you with groanings which cannot be uttered. Where you prayed in tongues with such intensity and with such anointing and with such fervency. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, God's calling us to higher and God's calling us to deeper. Well, pastor, we want to see this church filled with souls. I'm telling you and I'm giving us the remedy right now. I'm giving us the solution right now in the midst of the chaff being stripped away. God wants to use you in higher heights and deeper depths, but you got to let him take you to that place. Jesus declares in John chapter 15 and verse number one, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. God inspects and expects fruit. God looks, he, he goes up to the fig tree and says, why does this fig tree have fruit on it? Well, there's commentators and there's opinions about that. Of maybe it was even out of season. But I'll tell you, when God goes to the tree and expects fruit to be there, it doesn't matter what season there is. God can help trees to produce fruit in his season, not natural season. Well, God, it's not the season of revival right now. Well, God, it's not the season for that right now. God, it's summer. God, it's hot. God, it's... And we can excuse away the lack of fruitfulness. But every tree is known by its fruit. And time is what God uses to reveal the fruit that's being produced by that tree. He says every branch. Thank God he doesn't always cut down the whole tree. But every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. But every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. I want you to pull up the scripture here with Caleb, John 15 and 2. I want you to see it here. He purges it, purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. God does not bring a pruning or a sifting process to your life to make you lean, to make you hollow, to make you less of what he wants you to be. God takes you to a place of pruning so that he can take away what's not supposed to be there so that he can make you bear more fruit. You want to be more fruitful? Let God take away what's not supposed to be there. You want to have a fruitful branch in your life? You've got to abide in him. You've got to stay connected to the source. But you've got to let God purge away the things in our lives so that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse number three, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Verse four, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear, cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much. Everyone say much. Much, much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And I want us to notice here, without God, we can do nothing. That's 
if I'm not attached to the right vine, then I am nothing. I'm not going to be able to produce anything. But we have to understand that there are things in our lives that can draw away the nutrients of what God wants to bring to the branch to make it fruitful. If anyone's ever owned fruit trees, you know what I'm talking about right now. There are shoots that come off of fruitful branches. They're called suckers. And you literally have to take, and sometimes they might look like a fruit-producing branch, but you have to take shears and you go up to that branch and you have to cut those things off because they are robbing necessary nutrients from the fruit-producing branch to where they can make that branch unfruitful. Yeah, that's so true. If you don't prune away those things, they will take all of the nutrients from that branch and cause it to become an unfruitful branch. Right. It might have been fruitful last year. It might have been fruitful five years ago. But in the present time, there are little things attached to this branch. Right. Don't you hear what I'm saying right now? There are things attached to it. Well, pastor, I was fruitful a year ago. Pastor, I was fruitful five years ago or ten years ago. Do you know what I did seven years ago? I'm telling you, God is looking right now, and he is inspecting and expecting. He is walking through the vineyard, and he's walking through the orchard right now. And he's saying, ah, that needs to be removed, and that's got to be taken away, and that's taken away nutrients. Not to make you a bear tree. Not to make you look less than what you are. No, so that you can produce more fruit. How many want to produce fruit in the kingdom of God? How many want to produce fruit in the kingdom? As he's walking through the orchard, say, God, look at me. Inspect me. Peel back the branches. Peel back the leaves. And look to the very center of who I am. Make sure I'm attached to the right source. Make sure I'm getting the nutrients I need. And God, take away everything there that is not going to help me produce fruit in the kingdom of God. You may feel like it's making you more lean, but God's making you more fruitful. You may feel like it's making you more weak and anemic, but God's using the process to make you more fruitful in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. I wonder if there's someone who could help me pray right now in the spirit. Hallelujah. There's a young person that you could help me pray in the spirit. Hallelujah. 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 You got to deal with it. You got to deal with the carnality. You got to deal with the flesh. You got to deal with the ungodliness. You got to deal with the disobedience. You got to deal with the chaos. You got to deal with the things that are coming against you. You got to deal with every little spirit that raises its head. You got to deal with the man of God. You got to deal with the woman of God. You got to deal with it. Moms and dads, don't let those things take residence. It might seem like a small thing and it might seem like a simple thing, but I'm here to empower you. you got to deal with the little things that are stripping away fruitfulness, that are pulling at you, trying to take away the nutrients that you need in order to become the fruitful people that God has called you to be. Hallelujah. Everything that happens requires God's permission and knowledge. And in Simon Peter's life, what happened in his life required Satan to ask permission. Satan hath desired you. You. Satan hath desired you. He's gone to God and asked for permission. Because there's nothing that happens in this earth, something in the spiritual realm, without God's permission and foreknowledge. He's God all by himself. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. But he is also immutable, which means he changes not. And so the Lord looked at Simon Peter, who said, Lord, I'm willing to go to the death with you. How many times have we proclaimed some commitments with our mouths? But when it comes down to 
brass tacks, where the rubber hits the road, the Bible says all of his disciples fled. They all abandoned him, including Simon Peter. Wait a minute. I thought you were the one with the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I thought you were the one that was praying some binding prayers and praying some loosing prayers. I thought you were the one that was committed to him. You were willing to even fight for him. You were willing to take out your sword and you were willing to go after a Roman. You were willing to fight these things off. Where did you go in that time that the sifting process started? And he says, I pray for you. I prayed for you. I prayed for you. I can't emulate the words of Jesus because there's no prayer like the prayers of God, if I could say it that way. Jesus Christ himself completely submitted unto the will of God. But I don't believe it's too much of a stretch here today to say that as your pastor, I'm praying for you. That when the sifting is happening in your life, Satan's gone and asked permission to sift you as wheat. And God knows how to use what the enemy is using to try to destroy you to take away the things that should not be there. The Bible says that Simon Peter went out and he wept bitterly after he ran away from Jesus. He finally says, you know what? A little over three years ago, he told me to lay down my nets, take up the spiritual fishing net, and to come follow him. And after this whole process, if you come to the music, he says, you know what? I go with fishing. I'm done with this. I'm going back and I'm going fishing. I, this, this spiritual net's too hard to hold. This process is too hard to handle. I'm, I'm just going back to the way that it was before because I'm comfortable in the chaff. I'm comfortable living in a place of complacency and apathy. I'm comfortable living in a place of unfaithfulness and disobedience. I'm comfortable living in a place of carnality. Those are the areas where I feel comfortable and I've got a nice easy chair there and I'm just going to spend some time in that place. I'm going to go back to what I'm familiar with. And I'm going to go back uh, to, to familiar waters and familiar territory. Uh, Wait, I thought you walked on water. Uh, I know I walked on water back then, uh, but I'm going back to comfort. Uh, I'm going back to what I'm good at. Uh, I'm going back to what I know I can do. Uh, this other, this unknown realm, this binding and loosing, uh, this praying, uh, uh, all of these things he's asking me to do, uh, that's uncomfortable. And that's the unknown. Uh, and that's high heights and deep depths. Uh, I, that's unfamiliar to me. Uh, and I don't feel comfortable in that. I'm telling you, God is taking you to a place of being uncomfortable so that he can use you and anoint you and empower you and put his spirit upon you. NAC, I know the sifting process is not fun, but I'm praying, God, take us to a place where we are uncomfortable. Take me to a place where I'm uncomfortable. I feel this burden on my heart and on my spirit to ignite it's time to start praying some uncomfortable prayers. Dads, moms, stop staying in your comfort zone. Don't just go back to fishing. Don't just go back to the old life, the old ways, the old place of comfort. There's going to become a time when you're doing that old thing and you see someone standing on the shore as you're toiling and you're working. You're saying this fishing net ain't working like it used to. I'm not catching fish like I used to. I used to be the greatest fisherman on the Sea of Galilee and now I'm toiling. And now I'm working and the old way's not as comfortable as it used to be. The old way's not working like it used to be. And the man on the shore saying, wait. It's time to cross. To put the net out on the other side. It's time to do something a little different.
Does this man on the shore know what he's talking about? If I'm fishing here or if I'm fishing there, this boat's not very wide. He doesn't know what he's talking about. If I could say it, there was a conversion process that was starting there with Simon Peter. When he, in obedience, said, I'm going to cast the net out on the other side. The Bible says they brought in a draught of fish. And then he realized that it was Jesus. What did he do at that moment? Shame started to make its way into his life. The Bible says that he was naked in this old, comfortable way of life. He had allowed himself to ebb even to a place where he was ashamed to even face Jesus. He jumps into the water. We find them on the shore. Jesus is cooking some fish. He looks at Simon Peter and says, hey, there's a transformation process that's happening. You've been going through the sifting process. Now you're going through the conversion process. He says, do you love me more than these? He says, Lord, you know I love you. He says, I want you to feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He asks him a second time, do you love me more than the old ways? Do you love me more than the comfort zone? Do you love me more than your place of comfortability? Do you love me more than where you've always been? And he says, Lord, you know. The third time he asks him, he's probably getting a little agitated at this point. He's saying, Lord, you know I love you. I believe I'm in a room full of people and you love God. If I were to ask every one of you, you'd probably say, I love him. I love him. I believe his response here tonight as we stand is it's time to do something different. It's time to let there to be a transformation process from the inside out. It's time to let him do a mighty work in you that no one else is able to do. But it's going to happen as a result of you getting out of a place of comfort. Out of a place of the way it's always been. Out of a place of this is the way that I've always done it. Out of the place of this is what surrounds me. I'm just going back to the chap. I'm just going back to the cocoon. I'm just going back. No, God's saying if you love me, it's time to do something transformational in your walk with God. And we see it in Acts chapter 2 when the Bible says they were making fun of them. Some said these men are full of new wine. The Bible says Simon Peter stands up with the eleven because there was a strengthening that was happening. There was a strengthening that was going on. As a matter of the conversion and the sifting there was a strengthening going on where he says these are not drunk as ye suppose this is just the third hour of the day but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel hallelujah if you want to preach a Simon Peter message if you want to do Simon Peter exploits then you got to be willing to go through a Simon Peter process. Don't tap out. Don't say, God, the, the sifting process is too hard. No. I believe we need a spirit of Joseph, and I'm done here tonight, where he names one son Manasseh. And he names the other son Ephraim. And the meaning of those, the first one was Lord, you've caused me to forget all of the toil, all of the sifting, all of the process, all of the stripping away. You've caused me to forget all of the pain and all of the hurt and all of the bitterness and all of the strife. You've caused me to forget all the old ways. 
and then he says, hey, Ephraim, I'm going to make you fruitful in the land of your affliction. I'm going to make you fruitful in the land of Egypt. I pray tonight that we get the spirit of Joseph that says, God, what the enemy meant for evil, you meant for good. It may have been a sifting process at Potiphar's house. It might have been a sifting process when I was on the road to Egypt with the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. It might have been a sifting process when I was in the prison and I was forgotten about and I became someone who was just an obscurity. No, that's not what God's final intention was for you. His intention was for you to become someone who bore offspring. That number one was going to help you to forget the toils of your past, but also to become fruitful in the future. I believe I'm in a room full of people. You want to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. Now I'm going to open these altars here tonight. I wonder if there's someone that wants to step out from where you are to say, God, I'm willing to let you take away the things that are not supposed to be there so that you can reveal what's already there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wonder if some young people, you could let God use you in the realm of prayer tonight. You could cry some hot tears into this carpet. I wonder if there's a woman of God in this place. I wonder if there's a mom or a dad. You could say, you know what? Some things are changing. Some things are changing in the spirit. It might seem like a little thing, but God, I'm dealing with it. Because I want to be fruitful. I want to be fruitful. I want to be fruitful, God. Satan hath desired you that he may sift you as wheat. But don't curse the sifting. I pray for you that your faith fail you not. I pray for you that after the sifting, that there's a strengthening that happens as a result of the conversion and transformation. Witness of the Holy Ghost in this place here tonight.